Welcome to Steel Sports Finding Joy Conversation. As a featured event of Strongest Steel Safety Month, I'm joined by Julie Foudy and Valerie Condos Field. And very Woo-hoo! much. Miss Foul! Get the Arkansas house! Let's go! <laughs> I'm very, very oh, much. Sorry, Al. Sorry. I have an like Thank that. Thank you. No, I. I I'm, I appreciate your enthusiasm and it's, that's how we should begin, right? I, I was actually hoping um, that we could start from the very beginning and I was gonna, I was going to say that to you and uh, then from the very beginning, a very good, okay, Allie, Allie, first of all, I gotta tell you, you and Alan, I don't know if you did your homework or not, I don't when I knew that we were going to be on this call with Julie Foudy, I was like, seriously? And we're actually going to get something done? <laughs> Nothing. Allie, I'm sorry. Did you want to talk? No. That's- okay. Well, okay, the beginning. I did do my homework. And part of that is because I've been a, practically a lifelong super fan of you both. So um, I've been so looking forward to this day. And uh, you better believe I'm geeking out. And I hope that we can totally just you know, go, go with your your strings and your passions because um, I know that the, the conversation will, will probably lead itself. Um, and for the, for the sake of those who tune in later on, I would love to give just a brief bio on you both, um, just so that our, our listeners and viewers for Safety Month will, will know a bit more about you. And then I hope we can just continue on this this joy path conversation with with you both. Um, So first of all, to introduce Julie Foudy. Julie is a soccer icon. She's been 17 years on the US national team and was captain for 13. That's amazing. Um, She's a two-time FIFA Women's World Cup champion, an Olympic gold medalist. She was a division one All-American at Stanford. And for today, I'll say go card, and I guess I'll also say go Bruins today. Um, Julie's also a champion of women in sports. She was the president of the Women's Sports Foundation and is dedicated to developing young leaders through the Julie Foudy and ESPNW Sports Leadership Academy. She's a mom, an ESPN analyst, a Hall of Famer, an author, a producer, and of course, an advisory member for Steel Sports. So needless to say, she's an expert on joy, as you can hear throughout our conversation, um, and especially in the podcast, Laughter Permitted, which I have so very much enjoyed over um, the past, I guess, year and a half-ish. Yeah, right? two years. Crazy. Yeah. It's awesome. It's, 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 it's one of few I subscribe to, so I really enjoy it. Um, and then Miss Val, Valerie Condos Field, and Miss Val, as she is affectionately named by her former athletes, um, she's the best of the best in the gymnastics world. Miss Val has won seven national championships, is a UCLA Hall of Famer, a four time national coach of the year, and was also named the coach of the century. Incredible. I didn't even know that award existed, but I deserve it. <laughs> It's conference. Uh, it's conference Pac-12 Coach of the Century. Got um, it. Got it. Got it. Well, amazing. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Val is an author, a speaker, a former dancer and choreographer, a breast cancer survivor, and really, in my opinion, represents all that is good in the business of coaching, mentorship, and um, to paraphrase your words, creating champions in life through the through the world of sports. Um, so with that said, um, you both know we're in the midst of Strongest Steel Safety Month. We, we are spending these four weeks focusing on different topics. The first week was safety, safety first, best practices throughout all aspects of life. Week two was physically strong. We focused on prevention, warm-ups, and concussion awareness. We are toward the end of week three with mentally strong. And so you are sandwiched between mentally strong and healthy habits. And I think that is just the perfect place to put finding joy um, as it is such a, an incredible tool for, for us to become and maintain mental strength. Um, but it's also, I think, a habit and a practice. It's something you can't just 
have. You have to um, make it a habit. So um, I think you two are just wonderful examples of the habit of finding joy and appreciation. Um, so so. If, yeah, thank you. Um, if I may, Julie, um, it seems like you've very intentionally focused on joy and laughter in the past, in recent years with your podcast and, and other content. Um, it, it seems like that's a, a lifelong practice for you, but I'm curious what inspired your podcast and, and what have you learned along the way? Oh, um, okay, let's see. What inspired my podcast um, is my producer, Lynn, who's my co-host, who I worked with at ESPN shooting stuff, features. And she would say to me, oh my gosh, I actually think the best content is when we stop the cameras down, we stop rolling, and you're just sitting there chatting away with the athlete. And you guys are laughing and you're talking old stories and that's what we need to do a podcast on. And there's something we always say at our leadership academies, which is laughter permitted to the kids. Cause I think in today's modern sports age with youth sports, it's very intense and it's very competitive and it's very serious. And I was always saying to the kids, come on, this is not, you know, this is fun. This is sports. Let's, let's have laughter, laughter permitted. We used to always say, and, uh, and Lynn said that would make for a great podcast name. Um, and so she planted that seed years ago and I, um, shrugged it off for many years. And then finally, uh, we started it two years ago and it's been one of the most enjoyable things I've ever done. And, and, uh, in the broadcast world, especially because you can actually have a conversation with people. You can talk, you can laugh. I mean, pre COVID we would do these, you know, around a dinner table or we did one with Miss Val at, you know, mm -hmm. a conference, an ESPNW conference. And so you just get to talk to incredible humans and rather than the X's and O's of sport, which sometimes gets super boring to me because you cover that on a daily basis. It's like, let's talk about things that matter and we can laugh about and we could find, you know, some wisdom and nuggets from these amazing women. We do all women um, because I don't think their stories are shared enough. And yeah, so that's how it started. And with the intent, to your point of let's make it fun. Let's just, you know, I, I think that's really the gift of sports is that we learn so much about um, ourselves, our teammates, how to be a better human being, how to be a better, you know, more committed human being in our communities that's doing great things. And we all have that potential. Awesome. Well, speaking of having fun, um, Ms. Val, I had the privilege of attending a UCLA gymnastics meet back in early 2019. And um, it was one of the most just lively, fun, exciting sports events I have ever attended. And I have attended many. I'm a big sports fan. Um, I was shocked. I was shocked that the, the crowd was so electric. I was so impressed that you danced the entire time in stilettos and didn't even <laughs> seem to break a sweat. I mean, wow. Um, you were like just the main hype person for the entire crowd. And at the same time had this, what I would describe as laser focus on your athletes and an incredibly intense connection, yet you were visibly partying with them, really. And it, it, it as a co I was coaching college softball at the time, so I was looking through my coach lens and I was just thinking, this is the culmination of diligent preparation and also trust in their ability to, to execute on game day, right? Um, and so, I left there just feeling like I want to manufacture that kind of joy for my athletes. And, and I, and I, I'm curious, how did you manufacture that joy or inspire it in others in a widespread way for thousands, millions, probably people over such a long period of time? How did you maintain that? Uh, okay. Two things come to mind when you ask me that question. One is that I've always believed that the work is done during the week and that competition day is a celebration of all of your hard work. 
And um, I thought about that when I was recruiting a top uh, gymnast who was Mormon. And our meets were on Sundays. And she and her parents were not thrilled with the fact that she was going to be competing on, on the Sabbath. And um, I just like, it's not, it's not work. It's joy. It's a celebration. The other thing that came to mind when you were saying that is in the early 2000s, we had won four championships in five years, but our fan base had not grown. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure it out. We were like stuck at 3,000 people in Poly Pavilion that holds 13,000. And then it hit me that sport is entertainment. Let's, let's not forget that, that we need butts in the seats in order to continue to exist. And I was like, well, crap, I came from the world of theater. I know how to entertain. <laughs> and so I produced, I took over producing the event. And my goal was to get all of those families in Los Angeles to spend their hard earned dollars coming to a meet at UCLA. I mean, you got to pay for $12 to park, you know, mm -hmm. um, instead of taking them to a movie. How am I going to do that? I'm going to produce the event and it's going to be entertainment. And um, as soon as I did that, actually, we didn't win for a stretch, but our numbers increased substantially. And that's when we started averaging 10,000 people per home meet in Poly Pavilion. Um, so I think those two things combined, just coming from my background as a dancer, I don't have this DNA of grr, win, 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 win at all cost. <laughs> yeah, to me, it's, it's the beauty of sport. Um, and as you were asking Ju Julie, I'm going to hijack <laughs> the conversation for a second because I have a question when you were reading off all of her unbelievable accolades and I'm going, this is a friggin' Titan in <laughs> sport and in this understanding of the combination of joy and hard work. And it reminded me of a combination of a conversation that I had one-on-one -on -one with Kobe Bryant, um, two years ago. And, um, it was, we spent the entire time talking about joy and how important it is to infuse joy into everything we do in life. And the difference between joy and happiness, joy and happy, you know, joy mm -hmm. comes from this. It's an, it's an immense sense of pride that you bring from really hard work. And I wanted to ask Julie, I mean, you have you have achieved success at the absolute highest level for a substantial period of time. And you've worked with the best athletes in the world that come with all of that diva, drama, ego, the whole bit. How, how do you describe the difference between joy, happy and fun or are they all the same thing? Oh, Miss Val. <laughs> Uh -oh. oh, we lost you, Julie. Oh. Wait a minute, Julie. Julie went away. She's she's just muted, I think. Oh, I am oh. muted. How was muted? Did someone know. mute me? <laughs> oh, maybe I actually <laughs> did. They're like, oh, we need to mute her. <laughs> um, Miss Val, breaking it down between, okay, what'd you say? Joy, happy, and what? Fun. And fun. Um, I, I think there is a difference, right? I think joy is something that's kind of in your soul. It's soulful. I mean, being happy and having fun seems more uh, temporary. Joyful mm -hmm. is part of your being. And it's an energy you bring to everything. It's not just a moment. And I think that's what, um, that's what I actually, I miss the most when I think of like our teams and our success. When people say, oh, you know, what was it? A, what was your favorite memory or favorite moment? And I think they, they think I'm going to go to a, um, you know, a, a, a world cup championship and standing on a podium or when the Olympic gold medal was wrapped around our necks or, and that's not it. Right. Sorry. My daughter calling in. She wants something They're in virtual school today. You never know. We've already had one at the door. That's my kid, other kid now. Um, so the things I, I miss the most are, 
the joy that was always present with our national team and my various teams really, but you know, talking national team, it's like, to your point, Miss Val, there, there was a, a feeling and an energy around everything we did, which I've always to Ali, what she said earlier, I've always admired in your coaching. Like that to me was the secret of our success. We loved being out there. We loved the grind. We loved working hard because we could do it with each other. And it, there was a joy to it. Yeah, it was hard. And there were times where it stunk and it was, and, and, and it hurt or you're, there were tears, but the overriding emotion was always joy. So I do think it wasn't happiness um, because there were, oh, there was moments of happiness, of course, but it wasn't always happy, but there was always joy. Mm. Isn't that interesting? I find that fascinating because mm -hmm. what I got, the criticism that I got um, was that I didn't take my job seriously enough. Yeah. As you saw me on the floor dancing in my stilettos, as you said, and I was like, wait a minute, it's not, I'm not just sitting there pretending like blowing stuff off. I'm joyful because I've worked my butt off the whole week and I'm right. so excited to be celebrating all of our hard work with our staff and our athletes. Yeah. And, and what a great message to your athletes. Like here's the chance to, to actually enjoy this moment. My daughter just said to me the other day, Oh, I, I don't want to play in this volleyball tournament this weekend. It's too stressful. And I was like, wait, what? wait, time out, time out. Like you put in all the hard work. Why are you now stressed for this moment? This is your moment to like enjoy it. Go out there with a different mindset of this is going to be fun. It's not work, as you said before. This is your chance to shine. You've already done all the hard work. Now just. But that, that starts from the top. That starts from the coaches. But more importantly, it starts from the parents. Yeah. You know. For sure. Okay, let's let's throw it back to Allie. <laughs> well, you <laughs> keep it right up because I, I'm thinking about um, discussions you've had, Julie, about the car ride home. And I'm thinking, Val, about athletes who might struggle to celebrate on competition day and teaching kids, perhaps your kids, your athletes to, to make that transition from the grind to the celebration. And um, so, you know, in addition to your, your daughter, the advice that, that you had for her, just, you know, you put it on this hard work, enjoy it. W would you have other advice for, for kids who, have who struggle to just celebrate on game day i i have a funny story about that um i gave my ted talk and a part of my ted talk is to parents and mm -hmm. julie to see what you talked about it's about the car ride home because we know the majority of kids decide to quit sport on the car ride home mm -hmm. and i asked the i begged the question to the parents are you focused on the end result or are you focused on helping your child develop into a champion in life through sport? And it's very simple. You'll know if you are only focused on the end result, if you ask questions like, did you win? How many points did you score? Mm -hmm. And you'll know you're focusing on the end result and the process if you ask, what did you learn today? How'd you help a teammate? And then my favorite question is, did you figure out how to work really, really hard at that thing you don't like to do? And after my TED talk, I had a mom come up to me. She was Asian and she was so cute and so vulnerable. And she said, Miss Val, I, I am the typical tiger mom. And when you were saying and asking, do you ask your children, did you win? Did you get an A? How many points did you score? I was so proud of myself. I was nodding my head going, yes, I do. Yes, I do. And then I realized that was the wrong thing to ask. <laughs> I was like, I appreciate your vulnerability. That is so cool. <laughs> she was like, yes, I'm asking all the right things. Oh, wait, why not? <laughs> it was so cute. So that may have changed the whole trajectory of her child's career and relationship. Right. But, but you said something, Miss Val, too, that 
it shouldn't get lost on the listener, whoever's watching this. And hopefully there are a lot of coaches watching this. The tone comes from the top, right? Parents and coaches, you set the tone, Miss Val, as a coach that, hey, let's enjoy this moment, right? Contrast that with the coach on the sideline that has put in so much hard work. And I get it. It comes with the best of intentions, but they're gripping. They're tight. They're intense. They're yelling at kids. And the result of that is that the kids then start gripping and they start getting stressed. And so it's a reminder to parents, to coaches, to our behavior on the sidelines, any sideline, whether it's in any sport, what are you emitting in terms of your energy and your joy? Because your kids, whether you're pl- they're your kids or your players, are going to feel that. And, and they'll respond to that. I mean, there was a point where we had to <laughs> have a little intervention with Tony DeChico, legendary Tony DeChico, bless him. Bless him. He, he passed uh, a few years ago with cancer, uh, who one of the greatest coaches we all love. And at one point in a game, he was stressing out on the sidelines. And Mia and I turned to him. Me and him, and we and we're like, coach, coach, comma, you know, and he and he like realized he was like panting, and he goes, oh, sorry, yeah, my bad. And then it's like, oh, as players, you relax. So it's huge that behavior on the sideline. That is huge, and that reminded me also of I realized all of this years ago, and hopefully was starting to embrace it all. Um, probably 20 years ago or so, but I honestly feel I did my absolute best coaching my last six years after I got cancer. Cause mm-hmm. when you get hit with something like that, you realize that we all have an expiration date. I just didn't know when my was, I knew I wasn't going to die from the type of breast cancer I had, but you know, Kobe Bryant did not know that was going to be his last morning. And from the moment I had that realization, I was like, I'm not wasting one day. And I showed up every day of training or competition or travel day, whatever, purposefully and intentionally <clears throat> paying attention to enjoying the experience, whatever that experience of that day brought with my student athletes and our coaching staff. And when you, ha- when you come from a place of coaching or parenting from that perspective, um, it sh- you get out of that micro bubble of the all importance of having to win, 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 which is really our egos. It's nothing more than our egos being able to say, "Ha we beat you." So um, that was a that was a definite obvious shift for me. It's interesting how your investment and focus in the process and in enjoying the process led to so much winning by default, right? Like that, my dad loves to say it's about the ride. And for us, it was the car ride, luckily for me. But um, like you say, you were the top. You are the people that so many were looking up to. And to be able to maintain that enjoyment during the toughest times after adversity, for sure. and winning happened a lot for you, but what I'm hearing is winning wasn't everything. And um, Val, I remember you mentioning in a podcast you, after you retired and a, and a parent saying to you, you, it's like you gave us permission to feel like champions even when we weren't on the first place podium. I might be bit butchering her words, but that's what I heard. And um, can you speak to that a little bit for your athletes when like how to, how to make it not all about winning, but rather all about the, the ride or the experience? I think it's important to, um, delineate the difference between winning and success. Is that the right word? Delineate? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm asking the Stanford grad. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know anything. <laughs> um, And this was when I started to shift my focus early on in my head coaching career. It's like, okay, what is sport all about? Because I didn't grow up in the world. I grew up on stage, theater, right? So what is this world of athletics all about? Because to me, coming into this new, it was about winning. And coaches are hired to win. And athletes train and play to win. And okay, so what's winning about? Winning is about bragging rights. 
and bragging rights lead to money and sponsorship. So it's all about being able to say, ha ha, we beat you. And I was like, that is so friggin' juvenile. There <laughs> has to be more to sport than ha ha, we beat you. Seriously, people. So, cause at the end of the day, when Julie Foudy's dead and gone, it's not gonna be about her medals. It's going to be about her legacy and what she gave to the sport in the form of everything that we're talking about today. And that's when I really started to understand, holy man, crap, sport is a master class, a PhD in learning life lessons that one does not learn in the classroom. And I'm going to develop champions in life through sport. And literally when people would ask me if I'm in an airplane and, and a stranger would say, you know, what do you do for a living? And I'd say, I develop superheroes. <laughs> that go out in the world and make the world a better place. And I would talk to our student athletes about that all the time. And part of being a superhero is when you're in competition and you make a mistake, you're on balance beam when you fall, you've got 10,000 eyes on you. And it's up to you as a superhero to model how people should go through the world being able to own their mistake not have a pity party and oh, I suck and get down on yourself, but figure out as we talk about failure recovery, shortening that space and realize being able to make a mistake without formulating a, a judgment on yourself and simply looking at the facts. Why did I fall on beam? Okay, take a deep breath, brush yourself off and get back in the game with the same exact enthusiasm you had before. I think it was Winston Churchill that said, Success is moving from one failure to the next within it without any loss of enthusiasm. When you can model that behavior for all of those children in the stands, you're a superhero. And mm -hmm. you are a superhero much more than if you had a perfect beam routine and got a 10. Yeah. So we talked about that. I instilled that and ingrained that in a lot. And when they would make a mistake and they'd come down and they'd start sulking, I was like, get over yourself. Seriously. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm like life hard. <laughs> that's that's a great message to kids and grown-ups at all ages, really. It's quite practical. It is um, and it's the greatest skill set you will ever learn in life, right? You're gonna use that for the rest of your life. If you get that right, oh, you're winning. Yeah, yes, agreed. Um in thinking a bit about adversity. And obviously the, the past year plus has thrown the world uh, an incredible amount of adversity. Um, Julie, what are some joy inducing things that you are doing with your children at home, your teenagers, I guess, their growing up children, um, and, and also with your, your leadership kids, your leadership academy kids? Uh, you know, I think, there are as hard as it's been I, and uh, I'm wired to find the silver linings and things, thankfully, uh, but there have been many, like there's a joy in that I have consistency at home, which I did not have before. I was on the road all the time for work. I was traveling and it was definitely a reset button for me of, Oh my gosh, to have the ability to have a routine to, be consistent with my kids consistently here uh, to have my husband consistently cook bless his soul through all of quarantine. Um, it's just, it's been, uh, it, it's been a blessing in that regard. And it's a chance to, to, to model for our kids. Like, okay. Uh, there's a woman, uh, Miss Val, I think, You've, I don't know if you've met before, Colleen Hacker, Dr. Colleen Hacker, who worked with our national team for many years. The beginning of quarantine, we had her on the podcast and she was talking about, you know, this is a chance for all of us to write our own story. Like, how do you want to look back on this time? Whether it's two months, we didn't know at the time, six months, you know, we never anticipated this going lasting over a year. But how do you want to look back and write your story? Because you control how you write this story. And I thought about that all the time. Like we control as hard as it is and not ignoring the hard or sweeping it under a rug, but acknowledging the hard, but then realizing like we control our attitude in this time. 
And we control how much joy we're going to bring to this situation and get creative, get outside, do different things. So we've had a lot of, you know, of, of time to, to really explore that and do fun things. And I'm proud of that. Um, I also recognize that, you know, we're in a situation that's really blessed. I have a job that still keeps paying in ESPN. And, um, and so, uh, but yeah, I think that's what, you know, my constant reminder in all of this is, is, is to just, you know, really model that to the kids in an authentic real way. Are you finding that kids are in tune enough to have an increased sense of grat- gratitude as they returned to their, their teams and their sports? Oh yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's ignited in them. I see it in sports. I see it in, you know, school having to do it virtually they go back to live in person next week, actually. And they're, they're like, Oh, hallelujah. (laughs) I need to get back around friends, just an understanding that, Oh my gosh, you need a community in your life. Life is about relationships and interaction. And when that's taken away from you in a sense where you, you realize like, Oh my gosh, it, it came in the form of my teammates. It came in the form of my classmates at school. It came in the form of just interactions with my teachers. That's very different and very uh, difficult as, as we've seen to have that same sense when you're on a screen. And so, um, yeah, I do think it's given them clearly a new appreciation and also a new appreciation that I don't have to grind 24 seven every day in my sport, for example, that I need to take some breaks and to reset because I think it allowed us when we had that moment to reset, to realize, okay, you're going to be fine by taking a few days off. You don't have to go to every practice. You don't have to be at every game and you're still going to be okay. So yeah, it's definitely given them that perspective. Awesome. It was for- forced balance in many senses. For- mm-hmm. But, but, you know, Julie, I think that, I mean, listening to you, I'm just thinking, God, how blessed your children are to have you as this model. And once again, it starts from the top. <clears throat> it starts from the parents modeling the behavior that the children should have through this time and begging the question, are, are you just going to go through this time waiting for it to be over? Or are you going to figure out how to grow through this time? Mm-hmm. And to be able to have parents that go, okay, so this sucks. Let's not pretend like it doesn't suck. Mm-hmm. It sucks. Okay, but how are we going to embrace the suck Mm -hmm. and actually learn something and find joy through the suck? Mm -hmm. And that starts, again, from the parents, from the top. I'm all about embracing the suck. (laughs) Agreed. Um, Val, I think that that message of growing through adversity versus going through adversity is, is really powerful and um i saw in our steel sports athletes our team steel and steel united um a reliance on coaches for comic relief inspiration our social media was really active last year particularly when we were all um quarantined in our homes um and in thinking about the coach player relationship and your experience having supported athletes through unimaginable adversity how have you what tools have you found to support kids that you're not with all day every day they're not your family per se um you're their mentor and their coach and 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 how how to push them to maybe overcome or persevere, but more importantly, to, to write the next chapter in their own book of life. Yeah, that's a, God, we could do two hours on that one. Um, <clears throat> I learned a great deal the morning after 9-11, and I was having our very first team meeting of the season that morning at 7 a.m., driving to work, hearing about this this horrible, horrible thing of uh, the Twin Towers, and Obviously, everything I was going to talk about with our team was out the window. So I call my mentor, John Wooden, and I go, Coach, I, I got nothing. Like, <laughs> what? I need help here. 
And Julie, you know, as well as I do, coach never gave advice. And he said to me, honey, just follow your heart. And I was like, oh, no, 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 not this time. I need more than that. <laughs> this follow your heart thing is not enough. Come on, coach, please. He said, Miss Val, embrace the sock. Let's go. <laughs> And so I go into this meeting. Now, honestly, that's all he said to me. God love him. And wow. one of my athletes said, um, I, I, we're supposed to go in the gym after this and do gymnastics when there are so many more, much more important things happening in the world. How will, how, how will I ever go back and do gymnastics, which is so menial compared to the, what's happening in this world? And it came to me. I followed my heart. And I said, because we can. Because we live in a country that allows us as women to play sports. Not only that, because it allows us as women to be scantily clad in leotards to play sports. That's why we're going to not only just go back in that gym, but from this day on, for the rest of your life, you will have more intention of appreciation and gratitude every time you flip and twist than you've ever had before. And I remember thinking, God, Coach Wooden was absolutely brilliant. Because had he told me what to say, it wouldn't have been authentic in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that woman, that woman that actually asked that question, she ended up being a doctor, sports psychologist. She helped our USA curling team to a gold medal. The last wow. Olympic Games. And she just interviewed me. She brought up that she remembered that meeting that wow. way back then. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I didn't remember the question you asked, Allie, but that's what came to mind. I have a question for you, Miss Val. Okay. Because, I, sorry, Al, again. You knew <laughs> this was going to happen, though, Al. I got um, it. <laughs> Miss Val, like, as you, I mean, you've had such longevity and success in your career. And the thing that always blows my mind is you've had this incredible opportunity beyond the results to just impact women in such a powerful way when they constantly, because I've heard stories of women coming back to you and, and giving this example of, I remember this moment and how it shaped me as a woman. How, how, how does that feel as a coach to know I've had this much of an impact on this many kids for this many years? Yeah, Julie, it gets back to what I said about you. You know, when you, I don't want you to pass, but when you do, if I'm still here, <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm going to say, yeah, the bling is really cool. That gold medal. Whoa, that's really cool. But that's not your legacy. And as you well know, as well as I do, when I look back on my career, it's not the rings. It's not the Pac-12 Coach of the Year stuff. That's all fun. That's like, that's like lipstick, you know. Um, <laughs> the heart and the meat of it is when a student athlete comes back to you and says, I remember when you said this. Mm -hmm. I remember when you did that. The latest viral sensation, Nia Dennis from UCLA, she told me the other day, she said, and she's a senior, she goes, Miss Val, I remember my first week in the gym and you told me I didn't need to earn your trust that my trust bucket was already full and that, and she, and she said, you told me I was going to screw up and so were you. But as long as we admitted it, came to each other, apologized and figured out how to move on that I would never lose your trust. And she said, nobody's ever told me that I was felt, I was always feeling like I had to earn people's trust. Mm -hmm. And she said that, relaxed me just to be myself and she screwed up royally her freshman year she stopped going to class because she, she was going to fail and it was fight or flight she literally ducked her head in the sand didn't tell anybody she wasn't going to class including her academic counselor i find out about it and go ballistic and i walk her little butt out of the gym and over to the academic counselor's office and sit down and there's like steam coming out of every pore of my body and she said, before you say anything, can I say something? And I'm like, oh, this better be good. And she, and she goes, I want to apologize. Not because I wasn't going to class, because that was just stupid on my end. But by, by not 
by not telling you, I was basically lying to you. And yeah. I feel like I've broken that trust that you told me we had. And as soon as she said that, all of the anger dissipated. And I was like, now we can figure out how to move forward. Mm. Now we can help her figure out how to move forward. Um, so good. Yeah. Well, let me ask this. How did you do that? Right. The, the, the athlete is in deep trouble, right? You want to keep her eligible. She wants to stay in school. How did you, how did you find whether it was tough love or empathy? Or how did you coax her through that without finding yourself being an, an enabler or too tough? How do, how do you navigate those types of situations? Because I feel empathy is tough love. And thank you, Brene Brown. Being clear is being kind. Mm -hmm. Being unclear is being unkind. And if I were to soft pedal it and, you know, treat her like the horrible word that we call snowflake these days, that wouldn't have been being kind. Mm. And even the times that I kicked kids off the team and took their scholarships away, it was communi communication, communication, communication is paramount. And then to be able to really feel deep down in my heart and soul that I know this is going to be the best thing for her because I know it is going to motivate her to start t making different choices in her life. And um, that is, to me, that's being empathetic. Mm -hmm. Telling someone what they want to hear and soft playing it or, God forbid, um, making it better, taking over. I mean, that's, that's what I'm finding with parents. Yeah. is they do so much for their children that they're shackling them from growing up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's Julie, I mean you must find well, that it's Yeah, it's I mean it, it, it's what I love about this conversation of finding joy is that it's not always happy, right? right. right. It's not making everything perfect. Like you know that that the graphic that comes to mind is it's like everyone thinks success is linear or happiness is linear, it's messy, right? It's all over the place and that's okay. When you allow your kids to understand that this is messy and it's gonna get sucky and we're gonna embrace the sucky and we're not gonna sit in it forever, but we're gonna acknowledge it and then get out of it and move forward. Um, that's where I think, th that's what I love about this conversation because I think some people misinterpret, oh, you bring joy to everything. like cheerful everything's positive everything's great oh hell no i don't want to live in that world nor do i ever act like it's like that so finding joy is hard at times and acknowledging that with our players our kids our young people in our lives i think gives them that gift and when you do that getting back to an earlier question you asked Allie, <clears throat> when you do embrace the suck and and figure it out when you figure it out one step at a time that is what brings you joy and that is what brings you that sense of pride like like she said it's your soul that nobody can take away from you and that you will not lose in inside of you even if you don't win the game and that's what kobe said he said you know what my joy came from getting up at 4.30 in the morning and putting in two extra practices before the team showed up. Because when they showed, I was so full of joy, literally pride and joy, that nobody could take away from me, even if we didn't win the game. Mm -hmm. And what Julie said, I think is so important, that people think life is a friggin' Hallmark card. That is not, there's not one human being on earth. Sorry, kids, if you're listening to this, I don't mean to make you scared. But life, there's not one person that's ever lived on planet Earth that will not go through really, really hard stuff year after year after year. So the times that life is easy, you really need to enjoy it and not be fearful of the next horrible things coming around, but just understand that's life. And I remember when I got cancer, my, some of my student athletes were saying, they said, how are you doing? I said, great. And they go, you don't need to put on that happy face for me, Miss Val. You have breast cancer. I said, time out. 99% of my life is great. Yeah, I got a malignant tumor in my breast, 
but I'm not letting that affect the rest of my life. I got my relationships with you. I got my job. I got my family. I got my husband. I'm going to enjoy all of that. And as we have found out, especially young people who are listening, the brain actually changes its chemical makeup when you infuse it with positive thoughts Mm -hmm. of gratitude. Mm -hmm. That's not us just talking fluff here. That's a proven scientific fact. Yeah. Well, well, speaking of infusing gratitude, um, you both have rituals that I love. Um, Val, I've stolen yours and it happens at my dining room table every night at dinner. Um, and Julie, I, I, I would like to steal yours. I, I will be doing that when my kids are a little bit older. But um, Julie, yours is the high-low cheers. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love that idea. Um, and, and Val, yours, the ritual that you had of your athletes sharing a gratitude for something they didn't earn. I like that key element in there and something they're proud of that they accomplished that day. I think both of those rituals are um, ways that that you in, infuse gratitude in life and um, and both demonstrate it and ask for it from your kids or families or whoever you're interacting with. And um, I'm curious for both of you, where did those rituals develop? What, where did those come from? Okay, I'm jumping in here. Julie, I think that that is so brilliant, what you do with your children, discussing the high and lows, because mm-hmm. if, you, if you take it that to another step, I'm sure that they, they will eventually realize the highs are really, really fun, but you really don't learn much from them. Mm-hmm. But the lows, mm-hmm. when we're talking about joy, pride Mm -hmm. it's what we learn from the lows that fill us up with that pride and so i think it's so brilliant of you to marry the two of those into one yeah well and the cheer is the gratitude part you talk about like recognizing you're cheering for someone who's helped you out that you're grateful for that you have gratitude for right and that's another thing that um, I want the kids to understand at an early age. I, we got it actually, um, full disclosure, high, low cheer around the dinner table is when we sit down we talk of their, their high of the day, their low of the day, because I want them to also know it's okay to have lows. Uh, and the cheer is for someone they're grateful for. Um, we stole that from a woman who is my Wonder Woman with our leadership academies, Marnie McNanny. She told me she did that around the table with her kids. And I was like, oh, I need to do that. And then we, of course, um, also use it for the podcast where we close out. It's our closing segment of the podcast, the, the high, low cheer of whoever our guest is. So. Um, yeah, so we got that from Marnie McNanny, who did it around her dinner table, and I just loved it. So, I, and I love that people steal it from the podcast. I have so many people who come up and say, "We do that around the dinner table now with our kids." And I'm like, "Yay, spreading!" You know what I love about that too? What you just said is that anything that is truthful, anything that is really impactful in our lives, has been around since the dawn of man. There's nothing new. Yeah. It's just us reframing it and rephrasing it and putting it in vernacular that we can understand now. And so, I mean, literally probably everything I've said, <laughs> I stole from someone else today. I don't remember who, but um, I love that, Julie. Really? And that's the the brilliance coming out that, that, that Julie alluded to in our email exchange. And then I think, um, you know, both of you are just so full of insight, whether whether it's spontaneously de- developed in your brain or acquired from the many um, wise coaches and athletes and family members that you've that you've met along the way. Um, we're coming up on time and I want to end with gratitude um, because <laughs> our last day of Strong and Steel Safety Month will focus on gratitude. We are asking our athletes, um, staff, even maybe some family members to share expressions of gratitude wherever direction that might go. So may I ask you both for just the first thing that comes to your mind that you're grateful for today? The first thing that comes to my mind is, um, honestly, is my faith. 
because it has really kicked in with COVID because I, like Julie, I've gone, instead of traveling six days a week, I've now been home and I've been able to take time to study, to read, to listen and to have quiet time. And it's interesting my discussions with God have shifted from prayer, asking, um, please help us find a, a remedy for this pandemic. Please help us find a solution to start dealing with social injustice. Please let's find all this stuff. And it has shifted from asking God for stuff to sh asking God, what can I do for you? And then learning to sit in quiet and just listen and be quiet. And I'm really grateful for that. I'm 61 years old and it's the first time in my life that is like, if you would have asked me that question any time before this, that would not have been my answer. Hmm. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> just go along the same line, Julie. Just steal it. I'm like, like, do oh, <laughs> yeah, why did I let Miss Val go first? <laughs> Um, let's see, Al. I'm going to say also, while Julie's thinking, one of the reasons why I was so excited to do this podcast is from the moment I met Julie Foudy, I always knew her as this icon. It was like I was fangirling over her. Her humility is so massive. Aww. It is such a gift to all of us of how to go through life at the top of our game as a titan with like I said as being a superhero and her superhero part of her superhero power is her, her humility I have no idea what you're talking about because I think I'm a massive deal I <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I think uh, when I think of what I'm grateful for uh, the thing that I've realized in the latter stages of my life, now that I hit 50, I'm 50, woo, 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 woo. Uh, is I am grateful, not just for my health, and I'm not talking physical health, but I am grateful for that, of course, that I'm still able to move and run and sweat and things I love to do, but I am so grateful for my mental health. And for having two incredible parents that modeled so many, so much good behavior and, and mental health around me, given, you know, how we've seen people in COVID, right? How it's exacerbated so many mental health issues. And thankfully, we're to a place where we're talking more about it and it's not something we're sweeping and that people are more open about it and we can talk about it. But I think of that often, like that my ability to really feel joy in so many hard times as well is a gift that I've been given, you know, whether it's luck of the draw, DNA, my parents, I think all of that plays a part, but that's something that I'm super grateful for because then I can hopefully pass that on to my, my kids and, and the people around me. And I'm grateful that I'm able to surround myself with a lot of amazing humans that, um, Miss Val falls straight into that category, which is why when you said, Al, do you want to do this with Miss Val? I was like, oh, hell yes, I will run to the end of the earth if it's with Miss Val. Let's go. You both have the, the same enthusiasm in your response, which I mean, I I was excited before that, but I'm just thrilled to, to, to see both of your um, enthusiastic responses. Um, and, and I want to say thank you. I'm incredibly grateful to you both. Um, I'm glad we could finish with, with your shared gratitude. I think it's just such a great way to bring joy to others and locate joy for yourselves, even on tough days. Um, and so I'm just incredibly grateful for being able to spend this time with you today and to listen to your shared wisdom um, and, and moreover to, to your point about generosity and sharing that joy, um, I'm grateful to you for just being joy spreaders and, um, sharing that through sport and family and your friendships, um, and your platforms over the decades and across the world. Right. 
Um, so as far as I'm concerned, you are true heroes to me and to so many athletes and women um, in, in the sports world and well beyond. So I, I just want to say thank you for leaving your unique and fabulous, fabulous marks on, on the world. Um, so on behalf of Steel Sports, thank you a million times. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you.